Hi there, in this video, we will continue talking about the different kinds of services the fraud examiner can offer and the auditing to his client. And uh, if you remember, in my previous presentation, I said the auditor can provide the forensic investigation to his clients and the auditor should be qualified and should have good experience with the process of fraud examination. And why the auditor can do that? Because first, the auditor has access to the accounting data, and he can express his opinion on the financial statements. On the other hand, the auditor can express his opinion on the internal control over the financial report. And if there is a weakness in the area of internal control, then the auditor will be able to raise a red flag about the existing of fraudulent transaction that might happen. The auditor also can run test of control and substantive procedures on the financial reporting to identify any accounting anomalies or ratio anomalies where the numbers that he collected from the financial statements do not match with real life, do not match with competitors in the industry. And good example, if the auditor is running uh, like some analysis to an airline company, he compares the analysis to the average analysis from other companies in the same industry. And then he would be able to say whether this company is going in the same trend, same profit ratio or not. And then he can make some kind of further investigation. The other issue is the auditor can provide valuation and uh, analysis to the financial statements to the different accounts by checking the accounting methods, the accounting estimates, and then calculate the amount of compensatory damage, uh, which he can claim from the court. He can pass on all this information to the attorney, to the legal department, which they can present it to the court and ask for compensatory damage or punitive damage or any kind of compensation. In this presentation, we will talk about the calculation of the loss or the uh, calculation of the forfeited income or the calculation of the damage. And uh, we use different ways of calculation here, which you already covered in managerial accounting classes. If you took it, if you didn't take managerial accounting classes, I will go through the methods, but I'm not gonna ask you to do exact calculation, but you need to know that the auditor calculates the loss or the amount of damage based on accounting methods that we covered in accounting classes before. First of all, before we start the calculation, we need to identify the PIN. If I say that the company has got some losses because of fraudulent transaction that happened by one of the employees, then we say, how much is the PIN? If there is a contract between the company and the suspect or the fraudster, and the company as an injured party had suffered some loss and they claim it from the accused party, then we say, let us look at the contract. If the contract has a time limit, like one year contract or renewable contract, then we can make a good estimation of the amount of loss. So if the contract was breached, or canceled in the middle of the contract period. It will be easy to calculate the loss for the remaining time of the contract. But if the contract is perpetual, it means it has no ending, then it will be hard to calculate the amount of loss based on the contract. The amount of loss may be affected by the economy or by the condition of the industry, it depends on the situation. And we need to get consideration to the appropriate economic condition as a starting point. And once we do that, we can take it into the industrial level, and then we can compare it with other competitors. So when we calculate the amount of loss, we don't make it in isolation from the industry, 
the market, the competitors, similar situation that happened in the past, those are good guidelines that can help the auditor to estimate the loss. The other point is that we can use different ratios to see the amount of damage. And those ratios, we usually cover them in details in uh, financial accounting classes and intermediate accounting. The first group of ratios are liquidity ratios like current ratio, quick ratio, working capital ratio, and so on. The other one is profitability ratios like return on assets, return on investment, net income ratio, gross profit ratios. So those are identifying the amount of profit that are achieved by the company. Efficiency ratios, and here we talk about the turnover like accounts receivable turnover, inventory turnover. And then we talk about the operating cycle and the capital structure ratio. Here we talk all about the ratios related to the share, to the book value per share, the price per share, and the dividends per share. So here we talk about everything related to the shares or the uh, uh, long-term debt comparing to the shares, because here we talk about the leverage ratio where we issue bonds or shares and we we'll try to see the ratios between them. Again, I'm not gonna dive into this topic because we cover this topic in details, especially the technical side of this topic we covered in previous classes of accounting. But what I need to highlight in this course that the auditor uses those kinds of ratios to identify the damage. <clears throat> and once we identify, we need to know the amount of revenue that has been lost or the expenses that has been accumulated based on this loss. Then we have to choose a revenue or expense growth rate and then we can check the trend in the prior years. So for example, if the company is doing profit on 15%, for example, from the amount of sales over the last three years. And because of the fraud that happened during these years, the profit was dropped from 15 to 10%. So here I say there are 5% were forfeited because of this fraud. This one should be claimed from the suspect person. We can use a straightforward method or we can use other sophisticated method. The methods used to develop estimates of lost sales or increment expense that could be before and after the method or the benchmark, which we call it the yardstick method. So there are different ways to calculate the loss and we cannot make it haphazardly. Why? Because the judge is going to scrutinize the way that we use it in calculating the loss. So we don't overestimate the compensatory damage or underestimate it. It should be fairly and accurate. And we consider the bottom line net income, incremental costs subtracted from the incremental revenue. So what we usually say, we get the historical data and we see what happened in the year of the fraud and we remove what happened from prior years, and we see the incremental part, incremental revenue for this year, incremental expense, and the difference between them, and this is what we should claim. The damaged party must mitigate its damage, so it means we have to use our common sense and our trust with different individuals on the society and try to mitigate the damage to make it reasonable for the suspect person and fair to everyone. And here, when we calculate the cost, as I mentioned, the methods you see it here are usually discussed in details in managerial accounting classes, where we identify the cost that happened during the fraudland case during this year into two different types of costs. One, we call it fixed, the other one, variable fixed like the rent. So if we pay rent for real estate or office building, 
we keep paying the rent whether there is a fraud or there is no fraud. So this one, we call it fixed expense and it doesn't change. The other one is variable like salary. The salary is variable from one year to the other, or maybe uh, advertising or maybe commission. Those kinds of expenses are variable based on the sales, the production and so on. And then we use the relevant range. Relevant range here, which period that we need to address in our calculation. And then the allocated cost, like the factory overhead cost that we added to the production cost. And we use different ways here, either machine hour or labor hour or total direct labor cost. And we can use also accounting estimate and calculating the expense, like the depreciation methods. We use either a straight line or we use units of production or declining method. So those kind of calculation to do the cost have been discussed in managerial accounting, and we use them here in calculation of the damage that happened, maybe because of the loss of profit or incremental of cost. How we do this one? We have the expenses into two different categories, fixed and variable. And we can use account analysis where we look literally at the expenses of each account and we try to categorize them either fixed or variable and whether will be affected by the fraud or not. This method is accurate, but it's very tedious because we might have lots of accounts. So we might jump to another one, which is mathematical. We call it high low method. What does it mean? We calculate the cost at the highest level of sales and the lowest levels of sales. And then we take the difference between them and divide it by the number of units. And we get high sales minus low sales over the number of units to get me how much cost is allocated to each unit. This one, we call it high low method. We can take the same numbers, we use it in high low method and we put it graphically and we can use the graphical method where we use a scatter graph that can show us the trend of the cost. We can use also Excel if we have a lot of numbers fixed and variable, we can use the regression on the Excel to calculate the amount of cost allocated to each unit or we can use engineering way of calculating the cost. Uh, the variable cost application, we can test it, as I said, either graphically or high low or regression by Excel. And then we can retest it again to make sure that our calculation is accurate. So what I mentioned here is the accounting way of calculating the, the cost. But how about the financial way of calculating the cost? Because in finance, we have to take the time value of money into consideration. Because if I calculate the cost of one expense two years ago, and I calculate the same cost for the same item this year, I know in accounting, I might get the same number, but because the money loses its value over the time, I have to calculate the time value of money. And if you remember in finance, I think in the money and banking or corporate finance, they teach the technical way of calculating the time value of money. And it's very simple, you can get it on Google, you don't have to take an, a finance course, but how to calculate the time value of money, we say the future value is equal to the present value of the money times one plus the interest rate to the power of the number of periods, which presumably could be years. And this will give me the future value of my present value of money. So we use this one to calculate not only the loss for this year, but for the future that might happen. So for example, if the company had a fraudulent case this year, and this case will have impact over the coming five years, for example. So I have to calculate my loss over the five years keeping in mind the time value of money. And then present all of this to the judge. And here where they say the uh, rubber hit the road, 
we have to make very good case to present to the judge to claim this compensatory damage. So we meet periodically with the attorney to share all the data collected and analyzed. We make pre-judgment testimony related to the summary of the judgment, meetings with counsel where the, they determine how to proceed with the case. And here we talk about the legal counsel of the company. We make a written report where we explain everything about the way we calculate it. We might make official deposition in the court, a regulatory and administrative hearing if people are from the community or the other stakeholder would like to attend to see the analysis. And then we can make dispute for the resolution and then we go to the trial. So here, once we do our calculation and conclusion, we have to be sure of what we did and we are able to defend our calculation. Uh, the commercial damage application gather the appropriate financial document, review it, analyze the data, and then see the economic impact. This is byproduct. This is what we do it here. When we do the valuation, and here the valuation either to the asset that lost its value because of what happened, or it might lose its value over the coming years because of Rutland case that happened. We have to make the right valuation. So number one, we need to see the consideration that we have it in the engagement. Then how we come up with the real valuation for the asset and how we report it and make a conclusion to the legal counsel or the board of directors. As I said, by the way, to become a certified valuator, you have to take a certificate from the NACDA or you can take it from AICPA. Uh, the overall engagement consideration, we assess the economy and the industry situation. So before we make our valuation to the asset, we have to see what's going on in the industry and in the market, the ability to identify, gather, and analyze the different data, and then simplified versus complex valuation. Uh, we put the limitation, the assumptions, the different scenarios, and then we put our valuation under each one of them. Then we understand the client expectation and plan use of valuation services. What are the type of valuation engagement? We make either valuation where we gather the data and the information and analyze them. Or we can do calculation where we put all the assets, the valuation methods and uh, explain them. And here the service provided, a provider agrees in advance and the professional proceeds to apply agreed upon procedures. And by the way, the calculation, it's one of the services the auditor can provide to the client and it doesn't have to be published to the public. We call it agreed upon procedures. This is agreement between the client and the auditor to do specific calculation about a specific item or account or asset in the company. And how we do our valuation, there are different ways we can do. The first one, it's the accounting way. We call it book value. Book value, we take the asset from the balance sheet. We calculate the depreciation. We say this is the net value of the asset. It's very easy, but this is not good enough in the court. So we might look at other ways like liquidation. What do you mean by liquidation value? If I sell the asset now, how much cash will I get? This one, we call it liquidation. Liquidation, if you sell it now and liquidate it into cash, how much do you receive? And this is, by the way, it will be accepted by the court because it reflects the real value of the asset regardless of how much is written in the book. The market value, if I trade it in the market, willing buyer and seller, they come into the normal market situation to trade this asset. Liquidation here, you sell it and you get cash, but market value, you trade it in the stock market. How much will you trade it for? This could be another value. Investment value, assume a specific buyer or class of buyers, 
would like to invest in this cash. We can use different values here, which can be reported to the book. <clears throat> As I said, the book value is not used because the book value is historical and we don't feel this is the right way we should report the value of the asset to the court, but we can use market, fair value, or uh, uh, fair market value. And here we have to keep in mind two things, the future income stream. So if this asset is used from now like cars, if you calculate the value of the car based on the book value, you get the value that you use to buy the car minus the depreciation. But in the fair value here, we say, if I use the car right now, regardless, when did I buy the car? I don't care about the date of purchase, but I say right now, if I use the car until it gets fully depreciated, how much money can I generate from the car? This is what we mean by future income stream. The difference between the future income stream and the alternative uh, options I have. So if I buy the car or keep the car now, how much income will I get from the car? If I take the amount of cash from investment in the car and I use it in a different resource, how much income will I get? And here we use discounted earning and cash flow or market comparable valuation or asset and liability market valuation. As I said, those are methods. They are used in, in finance classes. I'm not going to dive into them because, as I said, I'm not going to ask you to make the calculation, but I'm telling you the, the auditor can use those items to calculate the value. If I go to the discount earning and cash flow, I say, if I use the car now, for example, I will use it as a bus. So this bus will be used to generate income every year which we call it CF, the cash flow from using this bus for public transportation over one plus I, which is the interest rate to the power of T, which is the years. So I take all the future cash flow divided by one plus the interest rate to the power of years. It will tell me how much is the real value of the bus now based on the future income that I will get. But there is another issue. After I use the bus for five, four or five years, I might need to sell the bus. So there is future cash stream coming from the bus plus the value of selling this bus after five, 10 years. And this is the second part in the equation here. V5, it means the value of the bus after five years over one plus the interest rate to the power of five years. So the two components in this equation is cash flow that is coming from the bus during the coming five years and the cash flow from selling the bus after five years. The other method that we can use it, which we call it Gordon model. And here we use different ways, like for example, P is the price, D is the dividends. And we use this one for the shares. And K is the cost of equity and G is the growth rate. And this is another method we use it in the cash flow. Uh, the estimating the risk adjusted discount. Uh, here we use the cap M, the capital asset pricing model, or we can use weighted average cost of capital, or we can use bond plus equity method or build up method. As I said, we use those methods when we talk about shares, we talk about uh, marketable securities. In those cases, we use those kinds of models and the technical side of those models is discussed in the finance classes. So here in brief, we use different things or different ways of calculating the market value or the real value of the asset, which we presented to the court and claim for some kind of compensatory damage because of the loss into this value because of the fraudulent case. I hope you have found this uh, brief way of calculating the cost or the forfeited revenue or the real value of the asset uh, very helpful. And if you need any question, let me know. But again, I say what I present here 
is not coming in the exam in the technical way so much as conceptual way. So you get to know what are the ways we use it, but I'm not going to ask you, for example, to calculate the capital asset pricing model. I just need you to be aware that these are methods used in calculating the valuation. Thank you. Bye.